Hello and welcome to the November edition of the Starry Sky News. My name is Nick and you're watching Astro Exploring. This is a series of videos that I do every month where I talk about latest astrophotography equipment, any other sort of general astronomy news, James Webb Space Telescope, and give you my list of top three astrophotography targets to image that particular month in the Northern Hemisphere. So let's start with deep sky astrophotography targets that you can image in the Northern Hemisphere this month. Now, for anybody new here, I say this every month, but just in case there's new people watching, I give you a list of three deep sky astrophotography targets that I think you'll be able to image with basically any setup whether that is just a static camera on a tripod with something like a 50 millimeter lens and a DSLR all the way up to using a big Newtonian or refractor telescope or something along those lines there should be something in this list for everybody so number one on the list for november is the pleiades m45 also known as the seven sisters now why is this such a great target to image for any astrophotographer well it's visible to the naked eye so it's obviously pretty easy to find you can image it with any focal length no matter what lens you're using or telescope so if you're using a 50 millimeter lens and a dslr for example then i've talked about this before on my channel you can also fit the california nebula into the field of view and you get two targets for the price of one and it makes for a really great wide field astrophotography image plus the pleiades are just an absolutely stunning target to image in its own right you don't even necessarily need a star tracker for this just a camera sat on a tripod will do the job you'll obviously get much better images if you're tracking the sky but if you're just starting out as a beginner taking your first image ever then actually just a camera on a tripod will do absolutely fine you can find the pleiades in the constellation of taurus and at this time of year if you look over to the southeast just as it's getting dark then the pleiades will be visible to you in the constellation of taurus in the night sky and they will be quite high in the sky and will continue to get higher as we move through the months now because the pleiades is a broadband target while we can't necessarily do a lot about light pollution without just picking up our gear and going somewhere else in a, that has a much darker sky what we can do is try and image this under new moon conditions where the moon isn't as bright in the sky if it's even there at all. That's obviously much easier said than done because clear skies generally only seem to come around when it's full moon. But if you're able to do it under new moon, then that will give you a much better and cleaner image at the end. Okay, number two on the list is actually two targets, and that's the Heart and Sol Nebulae. I mentioned these a couple of months ago. They're in an even better position now. They're basically right overhead as it gets dark. You can find them in the constellation of Cassiopeia. You'll basically be able to image these all night long, depending on your view. Um, you know, they will obviously set at some point, but anywhere up till about 4 a.m. potentially, depending on how blocked your view is of the sky. This is a great target for something like a DSLR and the Samyang or Rokinon 135 millimeter lens or a William Optics red cap because you'll be able to get both targets in the field of view at the same time. Or if you've got a telescope like me with a crop sensor astronomy camera then you'll have to pick one target or the other or you could of course choose to do a mosaic if you've got a string of clear nights both great targets highly recommended i come back to image these every single year just like the pleiades okay now the last one on the list is the triangulum galaxy m33 God, that's really hard to say triangulum now if you're using a camera with like a 135 lens or the red cat or something like that this is going to be really small in the field of view. It may not be worth imaging. Have a look in Stellarium to check it out. It is really small in the field of view, but I mean, I would still image it because why not? Ideally, you do want to kind of start with a small refractor telescope, something like my setup that you can see behind me there, which is a three inch refractor, the William Optics GT71 and a ZWO533 MC Pro. It gives you a nice tight field of view even though it's quite a wide field setup really and this is the view that i will get of the triangular galaxy with my particular setup so have a look in stellarium with your own to see if it's worth it or not but it's an absolutely beautiful target to image at this time of year i've never actually imaged it myself however <laughs> you can of course find the triangulum galaxy in the constellation of triangulum that is where it gets its name of course and as usual if you image any of the targets that i've recommended in this then do feel free to tag me in your images as you share them on social media although twitter's a bit of a dodgy place to be at the minute uh, but i won't go into that anyway 
Moving on. Now, I want to tell you about some new astrophotography equipment coming onto the market, the ZWO ASI Air Mini. But before I do that, let's hear from the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and app that teaches you about all kinds of STEM topics and they have thousands of lessons available from beginner all the way up to advanced with new content being added all the time. I learn best by doing. For me, it's the best way to learn. And lately I've been going through the advanced and applied science learning path. And I think this learning path will resonate a lot with you too. Learning more about astrophysics and other related fields will help me make better content for you. And I love how interactive all of the lessons are. Courses in the Advanced and Applied Science Learning Path include Scientific Thinking, Gravitational Physics, Solar Energy, plus many more. I'm able to fit Brilliant into my life by just dedicating 30 minutes each day to it, and it's amazing how much I have learned so far. I've been learning about the science behind the galaxies and nebulae that I'm imaging, as well as writing some code simulations using Python. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org forward slash astro exploring, or click on the link in the description down below. The first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off their annual subscription. And thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. All right, on to the ZWO ASI Air Mini. Now, every time I consider buying an ASI Air, whether that be the original, the Pro or the Plus, uh, it kind of feels like I do a little bit of research about whether I want it because my Astroberry Raspberry Pi is occasionally a little bit laggy and I'd like something a little bit more robust with an app. I do a bit of research. I decide, yeah, I probably do want it. They're always out of stock. And then when they finally come back into stock, boom, ZWO release a new version and I'm back to square one going, well, do I want the old version or do I want the new version? And by the time I've decided they're out of stock again, I wait for them to come back in stock and then a new one's released. Anyway, we have the ZWO ASI Air Mini. That's a good thing. It's not a negative thing like I'm making it sound. Although I don't really like the sort of Apple mentality of let's release a new one every year when we could have introduced all these features in an older version. But that's just me. It looks like a great product and I'm really excited. I'm definitely going to buy one of these. It's everything that you know and love about the ASI Air Plus, which has been incredibly popular among astrophotographers. However, it is 42% lighter and 21% smaller. It does everything that the ASI Air Plus does with a few minor exceptions, which I will go through with you now. The ASI Air Mini can't do live stacking if you use the 6200 camera. And that's purely because of the file size being so massive with that particular camera that the ASI Air Mini just doesn't have the computing power to be able to live stack those images. But you can still image with a 6200 using the ASI Air Mini, you just won't be able to do the live stacking part of it. Because it's a lot smaller, obviously something has had to give. So the ASI Air Mini doesn't have an ethernet port. So if you use a wired connection for your network, then you won't be able to do that with the ASI Air Mini because it doesn't have an ethernet port. It doesn't have a power on off switch, I don't particularly think that's a big issue, but I thought I would mention it anyway. It doesn't have an output voltage meter. That's not something I've particularly cared about in my setup, but if you do monitor that all the time, then that's something that is missing in this version. And it also doesn't have an SD card slot. Personally, I could live without all of those functions quite easily because I'm already living without all those functions because I don't actually own an ASI Air at all anyway. Um, but for others, that might be more of an issue. If you want to check out all the features that I've just mentioned, then I will leave a link to the ASI Air Mini in the description down below. The price is currently listed on ZWO's website as $199 with the first shipments being made in December. I don't know if that's plus tax or not. I don't really know how it works over there in the States. In the UK, First Light Optics have it listed on a pre-order for £228. When you compare that to the price of the ZWO ASI Air Plus, which I think is around £345-£350, then at £228, that's obviously a lot cheaper. You have to forego a little bit of functionality, but Personally, I think that's an absolute bargain, which is why I will definitely be buying one. All right, on to James Webb Space Telescope news. Now, I think it's fair to say that everybody in the space industry kind of expected the first JWST images to be of the Pillars of Creation. However, they've made us wait a few months, uh, but I have to say the wait was completely worthwhile. They released not one, but two images of the Pillars of Creation on the JWST website. One with the near-infrared camera and one with the mid-infrared camera. So two images of the same target, but with a completely different view 
of that target. So this first image was taken with the near infrared camera, which makes it appear as though JWST is able to look through the dust that surrounds this deep sky object, but that's not actually the case. It's simply capturing the details as it's imaging at a different wavelength to the second image. So it's unable to view through the dust because of the interstellar medium, which is the dust and gas located between the stars of a galaxy, which is why you can't see distant galaxies behind all the stars because you're not actually looking through the deep sky object itself. The interstellar medium kind of provides a bit of like a translucent curtain behind so you can't see beyond it. The second image is what NASA have called the haunting portrait and I have to agree they released this just in time for Halloween and it does look pretty spooky I have to say. This image was taken with the mid infrared camera which gives us a completely different view of the pillars of creation. So in this image the reason that there aren't any stars in the background as such is because at these wavelengths the stars aren't actually bright enough to be able to appear in the image which is why I think JWST is so powerful because it can take different images of the same object and provide a completely different view of the universe and scientists will be able to compare between the two and get a much better understanding of star formation in this example. So what you're looking at in the second image is a load of really dense dust and gas that is essentially engulfing newly forming stars around it which you can't see in the mid-infrared image, but you can see in the near-infrared image, which I think is just absolutely mind-blowing. And you can, of course, see all of these images on NASA's website, along with some detailed descriptions, much beyond what I've just been able to explain. And finally, moving on to a deep sky astrophotography competition. This is with Optolong. It started in the middle of October, but it runs all the way through to December 15th. There are two categories in this competition. There's a deep sky category and a solar system category. And the names of the categories obviously speak for themselves as to what counts for each one. First prize for the deep sky category includes a ZWO 6200MC plus an Optolong L Ultimate filter. That is multiple thousands of pounds worth of astrophotography equipment just by submitting into a competition uh, by emailing Optolong brilliant. In the solar system category the top prize is a ZWO 585MC planetary camera along with show 3 nanometer Optolong filter kit. There are also prizes for second and third place along with a talented prize as well and there'll be a panel of judges to go through all of these images and pick the winners. You may have heard of some of them, Trevor Jones being one of the more obvious ones that you might have heard of. I'll leave a link to the competition in the description down below if you want to go and check it out. I think it is well worth entering into, in my opinion, just to try and win some free astrophotography gear. Once again, I want to thank Brilliant for being the sponsor of this video. If you want to go and check out Brilliant, then use the link in the description down below to get 20% off your annual subscription. My name is Nick. You've been watching Astro Exploring. If you found this video useful, then please do like, share, comment, subscribe, the usual YouTuber-y type things and I will see you in the next video.